for Apollo 11 plus 50. And for those who are not familiar with it, I'll take you through a quick overview of it. We're just calling it the Footsteps of the Moon, the Countdown to Apollo 11, which happened once again 50 years ago this year. So basically we're providing um, a monthly progress report in sort of semi-real time plus 50 years. Just to give you an idea of all the stuff that was going on back then, which is quite, quite fun. And um, we'll culminate in the July meeting uh, talking about Apollo 11. Um, so we're going to have also a couple of feature episodes, one of which is tonight. Uh, the other ones will be on the Australian uh, effort and contribution to the mission and the whole program, which was quite, um, quite significant. And also the um, decision along the lunar orbit uh, rendezvous Apollo mission um, mode selection. How they worked out what type of mission they were going to fly and what vehicles. Kind of funny if you want. Uh, what they were going to do, because it's quite a significant turning point in the whole architecture of the uh, of the program, and amazing how quickly they made the decisions. Anyway, and once again, we look at the um, the USSR and versus the um, the Soviet Union. But first, we've got to do our time travel with tradition. So this is modern television in 2019. I'm sure you're all glued to it every week or day or whatever it is. Um, I'm certainly not. And we're going to do our time machine now. We'll just have to go back in time for a minute. There we go. There we go. It's on back now. Hold on to your seats. All right. So now we're back in 1969 TV. The good old days. Anyone remember Graham Gandhi? <laughs> you remember Graham? Ah, uh, yes. That was the good old days in Melbourne tonight. All right. So now we're all back in 1969. How do you feel? You're looking much more attractive than healthy. Okay, so what was happening in the world? I'll do quickly whiz through this because we want to keep... Uh, oh, you going to start this? Okay, so um, there was a bunch of things happening. Uh, 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 an Eastern Airlines flight was diverted to Havana with, um, with 87 passengers. And uh, Alan Front, who used to run the um, um, Candy camera, that all the passengers thought it was some sort of stunt relating to his being on board, but it wasn't, it was a real hijacking. <laughs> Just the good old days. February 9, there was a, the jumbo jet was flown for the first time. And it's just uh, been now this year retired on a lot of airlines. And 17th of February, um, they had the Sea Lab and this um, uh, aquanaut Barry Cannon was uh, died of uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. That was Sea Lab. What else was happening? 20th of February, Tricky Dick Nixon asked Congress to begin the process of abolishing the electoral... This, I put this in because I thought it was quite interesting because this electoral college thing has been talked about now about how distorted and wacky it is. But it, they were talking about uh, modifying it back then, but it still hasn't changed. Um, 22nd of February, uh, once again, 69, the Vietnam War was raging. Um, the final stage of Tet Offensive was happening. And maybe 28, the uh, the guy that shot um, Robert Kennedy was uh, was put up on trial, and he actually pleaded for the death penalty, but they didn't give it to him. Um, that was that guy there. What was happening in Australia? Well, um, nine passengers were killed uh, in the Southern Aurora Express train that uh, the guy had drove out of a heart attack and um, had a crash. He's sad. And February the 19th, the Casey Station um, was established back in down in Antarctica. All right, so let's have a look at Apollo. What was happening with the Apollo mission itself? Am I okay? Right. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so Apollo. 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 Well, we'll have to do the next one. How about that? Um, <laughs> 5th of February. Um, I'm not going to go through every line here, you can read that yourself, but basically there was a whole bunch of stuff happening around the Kennedy Space Centre, stages being shipped across, being stacked, being rolled out to the pad, etc. So the, uh, the, the, uh, the second stage for Apollo 11 had arrived at Kennedy Space Centre on the, on the 5th, and, um, and the instrument unit was on its way, etc., etc. Uh, the actual uh, lunar module ascent stage was being moved from the work stand to a cleaning position, positioner. 
for the operation of the building. Neil was practicing his landings over the Lunar Research Facility on the uh, 12th of February. Uh, back at Kennedy Space Centre, they were stacking the Apollo 10 command module, command and service module. Um, and uh, Apollo 9 was already out in the pad, as we talked about last week. Um, the Apollo 9 crew, which is the next manned mission, they did a press conference talking about their mission and what they were going to be doing. So this is the crew members here. Um, the 11th of February, Apollo 10 spacecraft was lowered uh, atop the instrument unit in the BAB, so that was being stacked, ready to go. Um, in the adjacent work, uh, work uh, station, the, they were preparing to stack the Apollo 11 vehicle. February 11, the Apollo 9 uh, did a wet test, demonstration test, which is loading propellants and draining them out, and then they had a dry test of all the other procedures. Uh, back at, uh, is it Houston? Yes, at Houston. And in Cape, the uh, Apollo 9 crew were practicing the simulators with the Apollo 10 and 11 going in and out after them. So obviously the Apollo 9 crew had the priority because they were going to go next. Um, and uh, this is the lunar module uh, simulator, Rusty Swiger going in there for some simulator work. Back at the VAB on the 17th, the, um, the second stage, the Apollo 11 second stage, was lifted uh, in the, uh, and put onto the launcher. Um, and they'd been working assiduous, uh, continuously on uh, uh, refurbishing that because that launcher was used for Apollo 8, which happened in December, if you remember, last year. And uh, they had cleaned up the pad and fixed all the damage, etc., that was happening there. February 17th, they were back in the simulator and um, uh, training with the uh, lunar module uh, and um, command module as well. This was an interesting little fact. The, um, they received a, a uh, well, it wasn't a fax, it was a telegram signed by 10,000 re residents from uh, the home of uh, Jim McDivitt. And uh, they brought it in and they landed off the top of the simulator down. So, uh, so out at the pad, uh, Apollo 9 astronauts were doing um, their countdown demonstration test, which is where they suit up, go out to the pad, get loaded in, do all the procedures around that to make sure everything is connecting, working, functioning, locking up, pressurising, etc., etc. Um, February 24, Lovell, Hayes, Armstrong, and Aldrin were out in uh, Texas doing some uh, EVA uh, and geology sort of practices and and photographing stuff and checking all the procedures and how they would do that. Uh, February 25th, they're back in the simulator. And this is an interesting little one, the uh, mobile quarantine facility, which remember we see after the Apollo 11 landing, the astronauts were put into the facility and isolated. They were doing tests on that. So this is basically the, the quarantine facility being loaded onto a plane and they hurt, they hoist it um, into, onto the USS Guadalcanal. And um, on the Guadalcanal, they were preparing uh, and practicing all the procedures of connecting the, uh, the the flexible tunnel between the quarantine facility and the capsule itself, et cetera, et cetera. Then it was uh, uh, on board the USS Fox. Then it was taken over and they did some pressure tests because, of course, with the mobile quarantine facility, they had to stay in it. They were loaded in it up on the aircraft carrier but then they were flown back to the States. So they had to check to make sure that the quarantine facility was going to be able to hold pressure in case the aircraft they were flying into in lost pressure. So they had to put into a, um, an altitude chamber and run it full, full that. And they had some, some dummy astronaut volunteers to go in there and see if they survived, which was kind of good. I don't know whether they got extra pay for that or they just got to keep the blue suits, I'm not sure. Um, so February 3, uh, on the sort of the administration side, HQ... Uh, NASA HQ released a 12-month forecast. This is quite interesting. Uh, Apollo 9 would be going in February 28th. That was the original launch date uh, aim, they were aiming for. Um, sounds like NASA's calling now. Uh, Apollo 10 was going to be May 17, Apollo 11. Uh, they haven't put a date on that, but that's kind of what they were going to do. So they were in 12 and 13. So the idea here is, of course, they wanted to meet this deadline, the end of 69. So they basically had three opportunities. If Apollo 11 had a problem, they'd, they'd try again with Apollo 12. If Apollo 12 had a problem, they'd try again with Apollo 13. As we all know, that changed because Apollo 11 was successful and Apollo 13 went into 1970, but that's another story. But uh, you can see how they were really stacking up the, uh, the program and trying to make sure that they um, had the best possible chance of beating Kennedy's deadline. 
So um, February 22nd, uh, the Apollo 9 countdown actually officially begun. Um, so this was going to be the first checkout of the lunar module with people inside it. There's only going to be Earth orbit, but uh, they were going to be going around replicating all of the functions, uh, uh, turning around docking, extracting the lunar module, putting crew in there, separating, uh, discarding the descent stage, coming back to the uh, to the command module, basically replicating all the procedures that would be required for a moon mission. So I've just done that really quickly because we've got a very exciting presentation from Mark. So um, we're going to head back to 2019. But I just wanted to find out if anyone knows what this is. Some space geeks in the room will. This is computing in 1969. This is the read-only memory, rope memory, that was woven into the computers on the Apollo 11 vehicle. Um, that's how they uh, they programmed the, uh, the, the the computers. So now we do our transition back to 2019, and we'll have a look at some memory from 2019. So this is kind of what we're using these days. And actually, you'll probably correct me and say it's out of date anyway. But um, high speed memory, of course, is all the stuff we're used to. So that was our quick look. So the next meeting, we will be looking at Apollo 9 if it goes. And these are the Apollo National in the Lunar Module Simulator. And um